Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, it's my first time in Istanbul, so it's a real treat. Um, thanks so much for coming to this talk. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to be talking about our experience building, uh, rebuilding, I should say, Cello uh, with the OP stack as we transition to an L2. Um, and I'm going to try to use as many emojis as possible to make this as fun as possible. So if you like this talk, let me know afterwards. Uh, I'm always trying to evolve the way that I create my talks. Cool. But I wanted to start on an interactive note. And I'm kind of curious, um, folks here have any idea what the most common chain is by daily active addresses? Does anybody have any ideas? Feel free to just yell them out. BNB, it's not BNB, Tron. It is, in fact, Tron. Uh, Tron uh, has 1.5 million daily active addresses. This is not what we want to hear. We are here, uh, among other things, to help scale Ethereum uh, this week. Uh, and yet, uh, Tron is number one. I don't know about you, but that makes me sad. Um, and you know, others have noticed this as well. Um, you know, Anthony uh, Sassano has said that um, you know Tron is um, kind of one of the best chains for payments. Uh, he's also said that it offers real value to real people. I don't know, that stings. Um, even if you add up all of the daily active users and all the other on all the L2s uh, uh, rolling up to Ethereum, even then we still don't surpass Tron. Uh, as an entire ecosystem of chains. Um, so that makes me sad. It makes me sad because this is kind of the future that I'm building towards. You know, we want to encourage the whole world to come into the house of Ethereum uh, and um, benefit from, you know, all of the incredible decentralization, self-sovereignty, everything that Ethereum provides. But instead, it just feels like... Um, uh, this is us, you know, it's just a few of us here in Istanbul having all the fun, just chilling on these super comfy seats, um, you know, but I think in an ideal world, it'd be, it'd be, you know, this many people, the entire world, right, onboarding into Ethereum. Um, so one way to think about Celo is um, as kind of the Ethereum aligned version of Tron. Uh, that's really focused on ease of use. It's really focused on kind of real world utility, payments, those kind of things. Um, and if you haven't heard of Celo yet, or if you don't know um, too much about it, maybe just to get everyone uh, up to speed and just on the same page, uh, Celo is an EVM compatible L1 uh, that is currently in the process of transitioning to an L2. And Again, we're really focused on, on ease of use. We're really focused on these real world use cases um, uh, like payments, like microfinance, like UBI. Um, and we're doing that by um, offering a really, really great mobile experience. So Celo has uh, a ZK Snark based like client that's built into the platform. It has a protocol that lets you receive payments uh, using your phone number as your identifier instead of your public key derived address. Um, and it also supports paying for gas with tokens. So this is without account abstraction. Today, with an EOA address, you can pay for gas with an ERC-20 token, which means that if you're sending a stable coin, you can pay for that transaction fee in that stable coin, um, which just makes Celo just really nice for, for mobile payments. And then just as a cherry on top, um, three and a half years ago, the community voted to make Celo a carbon negative chain. And so since then, the protocol has been buying carbon offset credits programmatically, uh, which has been pretty nice. And, and that's attracted a whole bunch of refi builders to the platform. Um, and you know, all of this, I think, has um, resulted in uh, a whole bunch of people coming to the platform. You know, the, this is a graph of showing daily active users over time. And over the last year, we've, we've had this nice spike which is pretty exciting to, to see, especially given that we're in a down market. We've surpassed the highs from the last bull market. And if you compare us to other chains, coming back to that token terminal chart that we were looking at earlier, you know, we're frequently a top 10 chain, uh, which is really humbling these days. Um, and we continue to kind of rise up the ranks uh, every week. Some weeks we're, we're number six. Um, and 
all of this is in, in large part thanks to a whole bunch of just amazing dApps uh, built, dApps and wallets built on top of Celo. One of which that you know may be interesting for you to hear about is Minipay. Um, who here remembers Opera, the browser? Okay, a few people. Uh, so it turns out that Opera is still around. They used to have a really great desktop browser. Uh, now they focus uh, primarily on mobile. They have this browser called Opera Mini, which has 500 million downloads, 100 million users, primarily in emerging markets. And they have recently, in the last month and a half, launched MiniPay, which is a stablecoin based wallet that's integrated directly into, um, into Opera Mini. So into that mobile application that has 500 million down uh, installs. And they've been slowly rolling this out to all their users using push notifications. And their goal is to become a Pan-Africa uh, Venmo um, that uses crypto rails. And so pretty exciting. Uh, there's another wallet called Valora that I'm involved with personally. Um, that's just another really great example of paying for gas with tokens and sending value to, to, stable co uh, to phone numbers. And so if you're curious or if you have friends for whom MetaMask is too complicated, I would definitely encourage you to encourage them to install Valora and try it out. It's just super easy to use. Okay, so that's the primer on Celo. Um, but um, you're here to hear about you know, our experience um, turning Celo from an L1 into an L2 uh, using OP stack. Uh, and so what's our experience been like? Um, just to rewind to kind of the summer, um, C Labs, uh, right around the time of ECC, proposed to the Celo community uh, to transition Celo from an L1 to an L2. And back then, we wanted to have something very concrete. We wanted something that people could really um, dig their teeth into. Um, and and so we came up with a with an architecture that. Um, was built on top of OP stack that included a decentralized sequencer, included one block finality, and included um, uh, cheap gas fees using Eigen DA. Uh, the ecosystem voted in favor of this proposal, um, which is really great to see. And ever since then, C Labs has been super busy uh, building uh, this um, OP stack based version of Celo. And so the first thing that we had to do uh, was add support for Celo native features. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, features that, that we've been slowly kind of adding bit by bit. Uh, the first of which is native support for the Celo token. So unlike uh, Optimism, Celo is um, you know, an L1 that has its own native token that you uh, use to pay for gas um, today. Um, and so when bridging ETH over to Celo using the OP stack based bridge, we had to make some changes to automatically wrap ETH into WETH uh, so that it wouldn't conflict with the native Celo asset that exists today. And so we've made a number of changes to the OP stack bridge. Uh, those are actually relatively light. Now from a usability perspective, there's um, not much impact for end users because as I mentioned before, you can pay for gas with tokens on Celo. And so um, users can still pay for gas with WETH uh, even if it's um, wrapped into the token form. So that was the first hurdle. Uh, the second one was around token duality. Um, so one thing that we have today on the L1 that we wanted to preserve for the L2 is this idea of pre-wrapping pre Celo uh, so that it exists both as a native asset and as a wrapped asset. And we found this to be quite nice. Uh, if you're building a protocol, you can either support, um, on top of Celo, you can either use native Celo transfers or you can treat Celo as an ERC-20 token. Uh, you don't have to have two representations of the same asset like you have with ETH and WETH. Uh, Celo comes automatically pre-wrapped. And so, uh, we were able to make this change as well, uh, which just required a um, smart contract um, plus a pre-compile that we had to add to OPGeth. Uh, I mentioned ERC-20 uh, transactions. Um, and so this, of course, uh, also required some changes. Um, uh, we've, we're actually in the process of redesigning and rebuilding our ERC-20 
currency support right now, um, but uh, it's still a relatively easy change that we can make to OPGeth, um, primarily um, at the beginning of every smart contract call and at the end, instead of subtracting um, ETH, we can subtract um, ER the ERC20 token and at the very end, instead of refunding anything that was unspent, we can refund you. And we do that by simply calling into the EVM uh, and using transfer functions uh, on the ERC20 tokens. Um, next, um, Cello has this thing called Ultra Green Money, which is a um, where basically a portion of base fees go towards buying carbon offset credits and retiring them programmatically on chain. Um, and so we had to make a bunch of changes to, uh, again, OPGeth to change how gas fees are, are spent uh, so that a portion can go to this carbon fund where they can be used to, to buy and, and retire carbon offset credits. And so we've been working hard on that as well. And then finally, um, one thing that we've really, I would say, uh, benefited from as an ecosystem, as an L1, is this ability to use on-chain governance to decide uh, block sizes. Uh, so this is something that um, Ethereum doesn't support and, and OP stack uh, doesn't support either. Instead, you have to hard fork whenever you wanna change the uh, block size. But in, in our experience, we found that it's actually quite nice to be able to use on-chain governance to change this. And so we've been working hard on uh, making the block size governable. Uh, and this is something that perhaps um, OP stack and optimism might find interesting as well. And so we've uh, been thinking about trying to contribute this upstream if 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 there's interest from the OP community. Um, you know, obviously Optimism has a really robust on-chain governance uh, system, and so it could choose to use this to govern the block size as well. And it's not a very difficult change. And to make all of these changes, we've been really inspired by the way that uh, Optimism has um, created a patch queue against Geth. And so likewise, we've created our own patch queue against um, the OP stack code base, um, and, and that's been working quite well. Uh, it allows us to merge upstream changes uh, without having to um, um, do too much work to, to keep merging these changes in. And so, yeah, I think we've really been inspired by that and it's worked really well. Um, while doing all of this work, we of course brought up a, a test net. So we have an internal test net. Um, that that also has a block scout node running here's a screenshot of block scout i see the block scout folks in the in the audience shout out to block scout um, we've found this really useful for debugging and, and testing the um the the test net that we have and you know every week that goes by we we add more and more functionality to the test net more and more parity with the cello l1 uh, and it's just been really really exciting to kind of watch and track um, the next thing that we did that uh, is particularly exciting um, is uh, integrate with EigenDA. Um, so again, coming back to that proposal in the summer, uh, we really wanted a way to offer really cheap gas fees uh, for all of those use cases that we talked about, um, those payment use cases, those microfinance use cases, UBI use cases. Gas fees are, people are very gas fee sensitive. Um, and so it was just absolutely uh, imperative for us to be able to um, migrate Cello from an L1 to an L2 that, in a way that allows us to keep gas fees low as we wait for proto-dank sharding, as we wait for, for dank sharding. Um, and so for us, that's, that meant um, looking around for LTAs and uh, ultimately um, we decided on EigenDA and so we've been working with that team to uh, to integrate EigenDA into, into our testnet. Um, and it's pretty exciting. So EigenDA um, uh, isn't yet public. Um, I think they're going to announce their public testnet at some point very, very, very soon. But they've been gracious enough to, to work with us um, in a preview capacity. And we've been able to integrate um, their code into our instance of OP stack. And here's uh, a screenshot of the, the OP batcher uh, writing blocks uh, directly, uh, or writing blobs, I should say, directly into EigenDA. 
um, which is really cool. And then likewise is the derivation logic that is reading from eigenVA uh, and executing uh, these transactions. So uh, all of this is now done. Um, and honestly, it was quite easy for us to integrate this into, into the OP stack. Um, in part because EigenVA, the Eigen team has, has done a lot of this work already to, to create uh, various proof of concepts. Uh, we were able to integrate EigenVA into the OP stack in, in you know, 48 hours or so, uh, which is pretty incredible. It's less than a thousand lines of code uh, to, uh, to the OP stack um, uh, code base, uh, which was you know, also, I think, quite, quite lovely. Um, and, you know, we did just very preliminary uh, benchmarking, um, just running on a single laptop uh, with four uh, EigenVA uh, nodes, again, running on that same laptop. So not really representative of any production environment, but still nonetheless interesting to look at. Uh, we were able to see, you know, 1.4 megabytes per second. Um, in, in data availability bandwidth. And so that's, that's pretty great. Uh, again, this is just a test. We should you know, take this with a grain of salt, but you know, that's already in excess of what dank sharding, let alone proto dank sharding, is looking to accomplish. Um, and so I think we were quite buoyed by that. I think that's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, next, and, and this is where I think uh, we're still a little bit early in our journey, but we've started um, some work in uh, building a decentralized sequencer um, for the OP stack. You know, Celo is an L1, and so we have a decentralized consensus protocol today where we run, um, you know, PBFT-based consensus across all the different validators. It's been uh, running in production for three and a half years with only one production incident. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and so we have a lot of experience now with consensus. And so we've started looking at what it would take to uh, modify the OP node to add consensus so that you can have multiple decentralized sequencers running and achieving consensus on every new transaction bundle uh, using some sort of um, BFT-based consensus protocol. Uh, we could either use the existing PBFT consensus we have today in Celo, or we've also been looking at Hot Stuff 2, which is a slightly uh, newer, uh, more recently invented consensus protocol. Um, and you know, one thing that um, I think is interesting in, in talking to uh, to Ben and, and others um, at Optimism um, is this idea of having consensus be written in you know Go and Rust for you know, the different clients, but then having the verification of the consensus be written in Solidity uh, so that it can be verified in fault proofs. Uh, and so we've been uh, doing some research into how we could do that efficiently. Uh, Kobe Gurkan, uh, one of our uh, cryptographers, actually built a, a library for doing efficient BLS 1231 uh, signature verification uh, in Solidity, uh, but it would be even more efficient if we had access to some pre-compiles. And so one thing that we've been thinking of is whether or not it would make sense to, um, to um, uh, propose to the OPStack community that uh, OPStack adopt a, uh, a bunch of uh, pre-compiles for BLS 12.381 operations. Uh, we've actually, um, there's an EIP you know, for this um, you know, to, to be added to Ethereum. There's been a lot of debate over the years about this. I think um, it, it almost got added um, a few years ago. And I think now with KZG commitments using that same curve, I think increasingly there's more and more appetite for this to happen in Ethereum. And so it probably would be a relatively safe bet to front run Ethereum and to add it to OP stack. Uh, and even if it never gets included in, in Ethereum, you know, it wouldn't be a big loss, but it would allow uh, for a number of new consensus protocols to be to be launched that are all using um, basically signature aggregation using BLS 12.381. Um, and we'd be able to verify those signatures very efficiently in Solidity, which would be really nice because we could then leverage that in, in, the, um, in the fault proofs. Um, and so um, something to, to think about, I think happy to chat with folks if there's any interest. Um, 
think, um, again, we've been running this in production on Celo for a while. We have multiple implementations, both in Go and Rust, uh, that have been production hardened. And so I think we have a lot of experience with this. Cool, so what does all of this look like together? Um, we have this nice little um, kind of emoji-based example over here, and I just wanted to walk through uh, what it looks like to um, uh, propose a, a block and go through the life cycle of a block. Uh, everything starts um, um, with a transaction bundle, and so you know here we have our decentralized sequencer on the left. You have a leader uh, in that BFD-based consensus protocol. Um, that proposes a new transaction bundle. Um, consensus basically agrees on that transaction bundle. Um, and once you have two thirds of all of the decentralized sequencers uh, agreeing to that, uh, you end up with this uh, sequencer certificate, which is really just a BLS uh, multi-sig aggregated and a bit vector that shows you who signed uh, that transaction bundle. And so once we have that, then we're ready to, to store it into data into DA. And, and the way this works with EigenDA is um, the sequencer communicates with a disperser. Uh, and the disperser um, effectively takes a blob of data and then um, disperses it uh, amongst all of the different EigenDA nodes, amongst all of the different shards, um, who then uh, use um, a Reed Solomon uh, erasure encoding to, to split up the data and um, uh, and store it, and then each of these um, uh, report back with a signature that the disperser aggregates into this Eigen DA certificate. Um, and this Eigen DA certificate is actually an aggregate of of uh, all the data, not just from the Cello L2. Uh, but from all the different L2s that would be using EigenDA um, at that time. And so this is quite nice because when the disperser then submits this to Ethereum to be verified, um, we can amortize the cost of that verification across all of the different chains that are using EigenDA. Um, the disperser also returns a blob key to the sequencer, and that blob key basically is a pointer that the L2 can use to, to access the data uh, for that, for that um, slot height. And so um, the sequencer has to write that blob key to Ethereum as well, and that effectively is used to, to finalize those transactions uh, at the Ethereum level. So now on the derivation front, full nodes download both the blob key and the certificate. They verify the certificate, make sure that the data uh, was um, restored by the EigenDA nodes, uh, and then they use the, the blob key to go and fetch the data from um, EigenDA. Uh, that gives them the transaction data and the sequencer certificate. Uh, they verify the sequencer certificate to make sure that two thirds of sequencers signed off on these transactions, and if they did, then they can execute those transactions, uh, and then they can derive the L2 block. Um, and so all of this, you know, works really nicely in the context of OP stack. Uh, this works um, in combination with all of the block gossiping that allows you to gossip unsafe blocks and then promote them into safe and finalized blocks. Um, and, you know, that's just been really nice to see all of that come together. Cool. So maybe just to wrap up, a few finishing thoughts. You know, we've been really hard at work. Um, transitioning Celo from an L1 to an L2, again, using the OP stack. Um, we continue to ship new test nets with new features, um, you know, adding this uh, EigenDA support most recently. Um, and, you know, I think the original L2 architecture that we proposed back in the summer is starting to finally come into fruition, which is just really exciting. Um, and then finally, you know, I think a lot of people ask us, what's it like actually building on top of OP stack? Um, what's our experience? And our experience has been really great, I would say. Um, you know, I think it's been quite easy. Um, I think the, the engineering team has been um, very, uh, I think, content and, and happy with level of documentation and, and just the, the clarity of the spec. Um, and so that's been really quite nice. Even though we have been chatting with folks like Ben and Carl on the side, um, you know, picking their brains, 
generally I would say the teams have been able to work quite independently um, and, and I think that's just a testament to, to the code base and to the quality of, of the documentation. So that's been really great. Um, probably the biggest unknown for us is just around um, kind of Alt-DA support. You know, we hear that there are some plans to offer some interface for Alt-DA and so I think ultimately we'll want to make sure that the work that we've done with EigenDA ends up uh, matching this interface. And then the same is true for decentralized sequencing. Um, you know, I think we, we definitely want to put our heads together uh, and, and make sure that the decentralized sequencer work that we're doing ends up uh, matching nicely with kind of the future work that's going to happen um, by kind of the Optimism Labs team. And, and so I think that's probably the, the thing that we want to definitely this week put our heads together uh, and, and figure out the most. So yeah, that's everything from my end. Thank you so much for your time.